Module 15, Landscape Painting Reaches Maturity. The earliest Chinese painting found were almost figure compositions of one kind or another. After the Han Dynasty, as painters increased their skill and broadened their scope, they began to provide the figures with landscape settings. The two painters, Li Shu Husun and Li Chao Tao, father and son, are traditionally considered the founders of a colorful decorative style of landscape painting known as Qing Liu Pai, blue, green and white, or Qin Pi Shan Shui, gold and blue, green. which became the basis for what might be called the palace style of the Tang dynasty. The Northern Song masters include Li Cheng, Fa Quan, Qiu Hasi, and Li Tang. The Southern masters include Ma Yuan and Hisha Kui. The earliest Chinese painting found were almost figure compositions of one kind or another. After Han Dynasty, as painters increased their skill and broadened their scope, they began to provide their figures with landscape settings. Gradually, the landscape became more and more important. Tang style landscape Until in the Tang Dynasty, the natural shift of emphasis from figures in landscape setting to landscape with figures was made. By the 11th century, the human figures in Chinese painting had shrunk to a size that truly reflected the Chinese view of man's relative insignificance in the scheme of things. Here two painters, Li Shu Sun and Li Chao Tao, father and son, are traditionally considered the founders of a colorful decorative style of landscape painting known as Qing Lu Pai, blue, green and white, or Qin Pi Shan Shai, gold and blue, green, which became the basis for what might be called the palace style of the Tang Dynasty. The origins of the style, in fact, go back to the six dynasties and even earlier where painting was often referred to as Tan Ching, red and blue, indicating that a technique based on a strong contrasting colors already existed at that time. Li Su Husun, 651 to 716 CE. After a checkered political career, he was given the honorary title of general. Chinese historians have often referred Li Su Sun and his son Li Chao Tao as big and little general. Li, though his son never held any military rank, nor even an honorary one, today none of their works survive. And the literary description of this style, crediting them with having painted in the Qing Lu Pai manner were written centuries after their death. If one considers this traditional view, it seems probable that Li Chao Tao, whose style was considered more advanced than that of his father, painted somewhat in the manner of a hanging scroll on silk in the Palace Museum Collection Taiwan, of which the present title is Emperor Ming Huang's Journey to Shu. Whether it actually depicts that emperor's tragic flight from the rebel, an Alushan or merely a summer outing in the imperial park. It is now impossible to say if the subject is the imperial flight of 756. It cannot be by Li Chao Tao, who had been dead for more than 25 years when the event took place. But while the artist of this picture, its date of execution and even its subject remain a mystery. The picture itself is a magnificent example of the brilliant courtly style of the mid-tongue period. In some respects, it is archaic. 
the exaggerated height and angularity of the mountains, the lack of middle ground, the decorative clouds, the precisely outlined trees all seem to derive from the 6th dynasty style as it is shown on the earlier stone Saraphogus illustrated. These decorative archaisms survived in one school of courtly and professional landscape painting until the Qing dynasty is attributed to a Sung artist. But probably painted in the Ming dynasty is a typical example of this style. During the first half of the Tang dynasty, painters made considerable progress towards solving the technical problem that had earlier defeated them. One painter, for example, was noted for his power to depict depth and distance convincingly, another for his suggestion of relief, another for the way in which he could convey an idea of color by the use of ink tone only. Then two painters were acquiring a reputation in one or another specialized branch of art. One might be expert in the precise drawing of architecture using a ruler in the Chi Hua boundary line method. Others in painting bamboo or pine trees or cattle and farmhouse scenes which were depicted with close accuracy. But none of the work survives but hints of both their subject matter and the styles are often to be found in the naturalistic paintings, in the corners and side panels of Buddhist wall paintings and in silk banners. The simultaneous birth silk banner is in the collection of British Museum London. The birth of two traditions. Chinese critics decided whether a particular painter belongs to the northern or southern school chiefly on the basis of his style. If his ink landscapes have a firm structure, if his line tends to be rather hard, angular and abrupt, if his rhythm tend to be jerky, and if he exploits dramatic contrasts of line and tone, he is classed as a northern painter. The great northern masters include Li Cheng, Fan Quan, Qiu Hisi, and Li Tang in the northern dynasty, Ma Yuan and Hisa Kui in the southern Sang, Tang Ti in the Yuan, and Tan Ching in the Ming dynasty. The painters of the southern school avoided the striking effects of the northern landscapists. Their vision was broad, their contours rounded and the lines relaxed. In place of the dramatic contrasts of the northerners, they explored the mysterious depths of nature in mist and cloud. The traditional founders of the southern school were Tung Yuan and Chu Jan. Seeking the way in the autumn mountains is a good example of Chu Jan's creation. In the 11th century, the great exponents were Mi Fu and his son Mi Yu Zhen. none of his original pictures are found. A single picture, the auspicious pines in the Taipei Palace Museum seems to approach his style. Me felt very close to the simplicity of nature. His method of painting in ink applied in several superimposed layers 
with washes and horizontal me dots me dian later became a standard for the examination of academic painters however there is also a flowing rhythm in me's calligraphy showing the range of variation in his brushwork an example is of a calligraphy by me fu detail semi cursive script ink on silk it is a written scroll and at present in the taipei palace museum me had a very good eye as comments by other calligraphers on the quality of his copies of works make clear he was a master of many different types of scripts and could reproduce other calligraphers personal styles a great copyist he sought perfection through the intensive study of manuscripts he claimed to be playing with the brush in his own style and his writings expressed natural spontaneity for instance he varies the spacing between characters brings them closer together or emphasizes their significance by their size the style went out of fashion during the southern song dynasty but was revived by the scholar painters of the yuan dynasty notably by huang kong wang and has continued to flourish among amateurs up to the present day until the 16th century the terms northern and southern were not applied to painters the division into two traditions seemed to have crystallized as early as the 10th century when it was based on the differences between two regional schools the centered in the northern song capital kaifeng depicted the hard bleak landscape of north china the other centered in nanking found a natural style to depict the rounded hills and misty atmosphere of the yangtze valley in time however the two schools lost all contact with their regional origins because of its possibilities for technical brilliance and startling effects the northerner style became more and more the special province of the academicians and professionals the more relaxed and spontaneous brushwork of the southern school on the other hand became the natural mode of expression of the scholars and poets some later painters liked to combine elements from both school during the ming dynasty this division of landscape painting into two schools was given a special interpretation by a painter and critic tung chi chang who saw in it a clear explanation of the split between the despised professionals on one hand and the amateurs and scholars such as himself on the other he traced the origins of the northern school back to the decorative courtly style of li su husun and li chao tao while he held that the southern school originated in the monochrome ink landscape of the great 18th century poet and scholar wang wei in fact tung chi chang application to this theory to individual painters based on the painter's social position rather than his style is full of inconsistencies for instance he calls li cheng and fa quan southern because they were scholars and amateurs but relegates li tang whose style was directly derived from fa quan to the northern school because he was a member of the imperial academy 
The terms northern and southern refer to the two traditions of Chinese landscape style and not to the special interpretation put upon them by Tung Chi Chiang, the art critic, and his followers. Since the time of Tung Chi Chiang, Wang Wei has stood in the history of Chinese landscape painting as the symbolic founder of the tradition of scholarly painting, which is called Wen Zhen Hua. The painting of Wen Zhen or literati, actually he was by no means the first amateur landscape painter and is doubtful whether he did in fact paint in the monochrome ink wash technique Sui Mu of later scholar painters as Tung Chi Chang claimed that he did. Several early sources say on the contrary that he painted in color. There were other more independent and original Tang painters such as Tang Tuso who were said to have made bold use of monochrome ink washes in their landscapes but who have not attained Wang Wei's special position to the eyes of later literati. Wang Wei was not only a great poet and scholar but also a man of noble character and profound feeling. Wang Wei, father and pioneer of monochrome ink landscape style, was a master of both figure and landscape painting. Among the technical innovations attributed to Wang Wei are the use of wash or splashed ink to create a sense of modeling and depth and use of texture stroke to shade and model contour lines. The composition Wang Chuan, country estate of Wang Wei, now in the collection of Museum of Kulog. Wang Wei owned a country estate called Wang Chuan. This place too became a favorite subject of art and not just because Wang himself had celebrated it in poetry and painting. Although his views of the estate are extant only in copies, the scroll clearly shows a series of several gardens or a parts of garden in Linus succession, illustrating the scenery around Lake Yi. The composition is said to derive directly from Wang Wei's own painting. His literary and pictorial depiction greatly influenced the ideas of landscape painters and landscape designers of later dynasties. To the critiques of the Ming and Qing dynasties who believed that the purpose of landscape painting was not primarily to depict nature but to express oneself. He was the ideal type of painter because he was the ideal type of man. His landscape they claimed must therefore have been the expression of highest Confucian virtues. Later copies of several of his paintings, notably a long panorama depicting his country estate, have been handed down. View of Wang Chuan Villa. It is a detail of a hand scroll belonging to Ming Dynasty and at present in the Seattle Wash Art Museum is a good example. but they are so various in style and technique that they give little hint as to what the originals must have looked like. Perhaps his style is reflected most nearly in the riverside under snow. It is an album leaf, ink and white pigment on silk. 
China, belonging to Tang Dynasty, formerly Manchu Household Collection. It is a detail of 9th or 10th century hand scroll. The artist used opaque white pigments on the silk, producing a reverse monochrome painting. The toned silk provides darks and white opaque paint builds the highlights. The simple and archaic modeling of rock forms is beautiful and unusual as is the primitive architecture. The deeply poetic mood of this winter scene, the restrained naturalism of the drawing, the emphasis upon ink tone rather than outline and color, and the complete lack of decorative mannerism all bring the viewer closer to nature than he has yet come in any landscape and closer to the feelings of the painter himself. The 10th century landscapists The long stagnation of Tang culture after an Lu Shan rebellion of 756 was broken at last in 906 when the dynasty fell and China sank into the period of political chaos, dignified by the name of five dynasties. But as before in Chinese history, political and social confusion stimulated a brilliant flowering of arts and letters. And it was during these turbulent years that landscape became the supreme art of Chinese painter. Before the end of Tang Dynasty, painters were already experimenting with an ink line of pictures as widely eccentric as those of any modern action painter in the West. Although these eccentrics founded no school, but must have influenced orthodox painters encouraging them to enlarge their range of brush techniques. It was at this time that the painters began to break their incline and wash poma by means of texture stroke to sun and dots teen. As their vocabulary of to sun and teen increased, their landscape acquired a new richness of texture that brought them closer to nature than ever before. At last, the viewer could almost imagine that he was standing before a real scene. Truth to nature was to remain the chief aim of landscape painters to the end of the Northern Song Dynasty. The great masters of the early and middle year of the 10th century were Ching Hao, Li Cheng, Quan Tung. Travelers in the mountain is attributed to Quan Tung. An essay on landscape painting attributed to Ching Hao, the P Fa Chi, literally record of brush methods, sets out the ideals of these painters. It is unlikely that any original works by these three masters survive, but a good number of copies can be seen. Fan Quan, who was active from 1990 to 1030. The tradition of these great Northern Masters is preserved above all in a magnificent hanging scroll of the early 11th century. Travelling among mountains and streams is a ink on silk belonging to Northern Shung Dynasty and at present 
in the National Palace Museum, Taibai, by Fan Quan. In the scroll, a huge cliff face plunges down to the river bed. At its foot, a jagged escarpment rises, silhouetted against the mist with a temple half hidden among the trees in the foreground. Two drovers with their mules emerge from the wood. Dropped to insignificance by the Persepice that towers about them. In a dark, mysterious cleft, a waterfall drops as a thin streak of white. By means of the strong angular outlines and a masterly use of short raindrop to Sun, Fa Quan has given the painting a wonderfully rich texture. While he conveys an almost superhuman sense of the living reality of nature by the power and concentration with which each leaf, each branch and fold in the rocks is delineated. As the 11th century critic Liu Tao Chun said of him, they are real rocks and ancient trees that thrust themselves up alive under his brush. One finds in him spirit consonance chi yu that goes beyond the surface of things and an indifference to ornamental beauty. These technical devices and such motives as the scrubby foliage surmounting the bluff were all to be imitated by later landscapists working in the Fan Quan manner. Painters of the Southern Scene Nanking was a flourishing artistic center in the 10th century. A very different tradition of landscape painting had been developing in contrast to hard grandeur of the northern scene. The mountains of the province of Chikyang are low, rounded and tree covered. Lakes and rivers abound and the atmosphere is suffused with misty sunlight. The great masters of this southern school are Tung Yuan, views along Hixiao and Hixiang rivers. Is a beautiful example. Yuan was the superintendent of parks under the cultivated emperor of the southern Tang dynasty. Li Hao Chu and his pupil, the monk and the painter Chu Zhan, who went to live in a monastery in Kaifeng in 975 after the establishment of the Song dynasty and the subsequent fall of the southern tongue. The style of the brushwork was loose and relaxed. They placed less emphasis on outline and contour than did the northern painters rather than use the short angular brush strokes of the northerners. They drew hills with long trailing hemp fiber to soon grouping boulders like lumps of alum on the crests. The contrast between the northern and southern styles becomes very clear if comparison of Fan Quan's traveling amid mountains and streams, hanging scroll, detail of early 11th century, ink and light colors on silk, Northern Shou Dynasty, National Museum, Taiwan, is made with a copy of Fan Quan's scroll.
and Chujan's painting Thick Forest and Serried Peaks is done. The painting of Chujan is original and in some respect it is too advanced for the 10th century and it points rather to the 14th century revival of Chujan's style. The qualities of the painting is its relaxed brushwork, the long loose hemp fiber to sun, the groups of rocks on the hilltops, the rich dense foliage and heavy moisture laden atmosphere of the southern scenes. The path that leads up the side of the gorge carries not only the viewer's eye but also his spirit deep into the heart of the mountains. A Buddhist monastery in mountains, a hanging scroll of Buddhist monastery in the mountains is attributed to Chu Jan, who was a Buddhist monk and was specially noted for his power to suggest not only pictorial but also spiritual depth in his landscape. The painter is telling us that It is there, perhaps in the temple, whose roofs can be seen further up the valley, that he shall find the clue to the meaning of existence.